Hey, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want to try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. And today we're going to be looking at the Fire Emblem series for the very first time with Awakening. This was made possible by Jasper, who has helped me with all of my 3DS episodes in the past. Thank you so, so much, Jasper. You are the man. But with that said, I'm really surprised that there was so much to look at in a Fire Emblem game of all things. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about here. So the first category that I want to get into is character models, because obviously it's nice to be able to look at some of the heroes and the villains and stuff like that, especially in a game where it's all compressed with aliasing and on a small screen. It'll be nice to be able to look at these models up close and with full clarity. You just saw there with Lucina that even when she wears her butterfly mask, her eyes are still there underneath, and she is not the only character that goes through this. The Risen, or Corpse Soldiers in the Japanese version, are undead characters in this franchise, and something that's really interesting here is that the undead looking part of their bodies seems to be just a mask. There's a little bit of artwork to suggest that this would be the case. Still though, it's kind of funny to see that if you take the camera past the mask on these character models, you will find a regular human face. And it makes me wonder if this was a choice that was made first with the character models, seeing as it seems that this system is able to place objects on existing character models very much like a character customizer. And it gets absolutely foolish later in the game, like this one right here has a helmet that when you take it past the helmet, you can see the risen face. And then if you take the camera past the risen face, you can once again see a human face. Or with this character has a completely covered up face with a helmet, take the camera inside and you can find another risen face, but no human face. But anyways, like I said, it's really hard to see some of these character faces. So I wanted to show you one of the earliest enemies up close and show you the detail on their face that is actually pretty impressive compared to some of the other main characters that you see throughout the game. And not only that, you might remember that you can change the camera perspective in Fire Emblem Awakening, and you can even see battles in a first-person perspective. Well, taking the camera outside of the boundaries here will show you that the entire character model is completely called out, and what's left behind is just the character's weapon, and if they have a mount. Another character detail that you might be surprised to see is that the character Basilio has an eye patch, and that if you take the camera inside of that eye patch, you will see that he has a very functional eye, one that matches the one on the other side of his face. This is something that we actually talked about in the Batman Arkham episode, where this is way more common than the developers going through the trouble of making a messed up eye or a missing eye, like they did in that episode. And then let's talk about Grima's Robin form. Normally you can't see the entirety of Grima until a second or two right after he's revealed to be Robin, but even then he's completely masked in dark smoke. Whereas here, if you take the camera around, you can see that it's just basically like a blank character. No hair or anything, but it does seem to imply that he has a t-shirt and shorts. And then here's something that I found really, really bizarre. Grima itself is something that's very rarely shown to the player, but even then you only get to see it from the ground level looking at its belly. So I'm taking the camera around here to kind of show you this model up close because this is the first time that anybody has ever seen this in its entirety. We get a good look at Grima's eyes, its snout, the wings, the top of its back, and its belly. I, well, I hope that that's its belly. I really, really want to believe that. Well, anyways, before we move on to a cutscene with a really funny thing going on out of bounds, let me talk to you about the sponsor that inspired me to even want to make this episode, Unicorn Overlord. I'm really excited about today's sponsor, and why am I excited about a sponsor of all things? Because today I get to talk about Unicorn Overlord, which is a hyper-polished strategy RPG game that is coming out from the folks that brought you 13 Sentinels. If you've ever been a fan of strategy RPGs, but especially those retro ones, this game is gonna be absolutely up your alley. But the game isn't all about treading old ground. The aesthetic of this game is otherworldly. Not only is the art style incredibly easy on the eyes, but somehow, some way, this team managed to do a ton of frame-by-frame -frame animation for so many characters, as well as incredibly deep and rich environments. Unicorn Overlord comes out digitally on Nintendo Switch, Xbox Series S and X, PS5, and PS4, and physically for Nintendo Switch, Xbox X, and PS5. And if you're already interested in picking up this game, it helps me out in the future if you click the link in the video description or in the pinned comment down below to show them that Team Boundary Break loves strategy RPGs. And I am going to speak personally for a second and say that everything I just said, I 100% believe in. So if you don't believe me, go check it out for yourself. There's a demo on all platforms and you can carry over your progress in to the main game if you like it. Again, I'm always super excited to talk about games that are clearly built from passion. And if you ask 
ask me, Unicorn Overlord is going to be one of those games that people are going to be talking about for a good few years after its release. Well, anyways, Unicorn Overlord, thank you for the sponsor, and back to the show. So anyways, like I said, this cutscene here with Avert shows her slapping a soldier, but they pan the camera up so that you can't see it. But the cutscene seems to hide a unused animation, one that maybe was used in a beta version of the game, and then left behind and probably left to loop before the player moves on forward with the scene to get the soldier back in frame. But basically, what you're looking at here is what seems to be a deep impact to the person's head, causing his neck to snap. There's nothing else quite like this in the entire game, and I just love the idea that Aversa just broke this guy's neck. Easily my favorite discovery made for this video. Anyway, let's, let's go back to Grima because there's a lot of instances where you're shown Grima, but because the monster model is so huge, the developers had to do all sorts of different things in order to make it function well on a 3DS hardware. For example, this Battle Arena version of Grima has a lot of its wings missing, in some part due to the fact that it might obstruct the camera view, but the underbelly of this arena is also completely unmodeled once again to save on resources, something that I thought for sure I was going to see in that cutscene model that we didn't end up seeing. But one detail this has over the cutscene model version is that the wings on its neck are actually animated. And interestingly, when Grima turns around to face the player, the original head and neck gets called out and a new model is swapped in that clearly does not connect to the body if you look at it from other angles. Also, again, I just wanted to do a close-up look of Grima's face after the snout breaks off, I guess. There's a human-shaped face that's there instead, and obviously this is shown to the player, but I just wanted to do a close-up look of it, simply because, yet again, these details are a little bit harder to make out on the 3DS hardware. Anyways, moving on to a topic that I did not think would be interesting for this episode, but I think you guys are going to find it to be one of the most interesting parts of this episode. The illustrated artwork that occasionally gets shown in the game is in a 3D plane thanks to the 3DS hardware trying to provide 3D depth, which means that both images are in the same 3D plane. And weirdly enough, once that scene with Krom is off camera, it routinely fades out and pops back in. Think of this for one trippy looking scene. And then there's that scene near the end of the game where you finally get to see Grima as an illustrated artwork piece, and he has three separate layers to him, which means that clearly there's going to be something going on underneath each layer. So let's take a quick look. Let's remove Grima's face to show his mid-portion body, and you can see all this unused artwork that's supposed to chassis the head. And again, this is so bizarre because normally this amount of detail would not be in a piece of artwork like this. The artist would typically know where to start and end, so they don't have to waste their time here. But so much of this is just completely covered up by Grima's head, and taking it down another layer, will show you the exact same thing. Like you can see the well, the armpits of these wings here, which again, not something the player is ever going to see ever. Definitely some really wild stuff. Here's one of the earliest cutscenes with Sumia. And again, if you remove some of these layers here, you can see that the neck of the Pegasus has a lot of added detail that the player wouldn't get to see. Now this is something that I more expect to see. These are just very plain color swashes that sort of represent a work in progress rather than say like the actual detail of the horse's neck or something being hidden underneath. Then I wanted to show you this close-up shot of Lucina showing off the brand to the mother. And there's a couple things to note here. One, the original color of the character was more on model, and so they had to add a translucent black square to change the coloration of this scene. On top of that, the twinkle in her eye is a separate object from the art itself, and even has a 3D depth to it. Here's a quick little looky-loo of this town scene, and I just wanted to show off the various layers of it. Because again, it's just something that's kind of cool to look at. Just nothing very significant like the last few things we were talking about. I mean, of course, you can see like the legs of some of the townspeople, but since they're insignificant to the story anyway, it's not super exciting and we're going to move on from that. Here's another scene where an army is about to storm a castle and you can see a couple of army men that are completely hidden by the artwork and they're actually really funny to look at. We got this guy with a really long tail coat and another guy with a completely missing torso and arm. Again. These two characters are something you would never be able to see otherwise. So it's just kind of neat to see these incomplete pieces of artwork that are just hidden in the game. Here's another scene where Krom announces his reign as well as his 
wife of choosing, and hidden behind the balcony is more details to Krom's body, as well as more details to his wife that is holding a bouquet and also has sort of a ribbon wrapped around her waist. And again, these are details that would never be able to be seen by the player. And lastly, I want to do a zoom out of this site here. What you saw a second ago was a forced perspective shot of Gangreel, who is just standing in the middle of nowhere. This is something that's very common in 3D animation and video games because it allows the artist to set up whatever dynamic shot they want. But like I said, it's less about that and more about just giving you a zoom out of this really cool story area that has the skull of Grima, and you can really, really get a sense of its scale when you look at the entire thing all in one shot. And then again, I want to give a huge thank you to Jasper, who again, not only made the camera, but also gave me the option to remove HUD elements so that we could take a look at this area that's using the file select screen as well as the very, very end of the game. We've got stuff like a chair, a couple of books by the chair, as well as desk elements that are never shown to the player. But what's the most interesting thing of all is that this book that the player always gets to see in the background actually has a title that's legible. Taking the camera underneath the desk and pointing it at the back of the book will show you that its title is called The Book of Secrets. Now this could be a reference to The Secret Book, which is a stat booster in the Fire Emblem series, but I will leave that one up to you guys. Either way, this is a title to a book that you would never be able to see otherwise. And now I wanted to show you some of the battle maps from different angles. Usually there's only a scant amount of details that are just outside the boundaries, and then it just sort of ends there. The game developers are pretty good about this. In fact, not only are they good about that, but they're also pretty good about culling as well. But again, one of the cool things about Awakening is that its water layer is well underneath the map, and this is pretty much because it allows the 3D depth scaler from the 3DS to give you a sense of depth for the rivers and oceans and stuff. It's really cool to see an entire flat square of water though completely underneath the map. Not only that though, but there are details to these maps that are really, really hard to see. So I'm gonna take the camera as close as I possibly can to show you things like ducks. Never in my life did I think that in Fire Emblem Awakening, we would have a bird segment for Boundary Break, but here we got two distinct looking duck textures and then over to the left of the same map, we have a crane. I really appreciate that little extra tinge of effort, as it really does give a sense of life to these maps. Moving on to the interior scene, we have these ornamental armor collections. And the detail on these, are, of course, are very, very low. But what's really interesting is that if you take the camera underneath them and then put the camera really close up to it, you can see that it shares a texture sheet with the interior building. In fact, I can take the camera right over to what this texture is and show you it in relation to the armor statue. Then we got this other map with a town here, and I was taking the camera inside of all sorts of different types of buildings and not really finding much, but this is one of those rare maps where yet again you can see the texture mapping on a certain model at a certain time. That's right, inside the church here on the floor basically, you could see textures for various different things that were used throughout this map yet again. Now let's finally talk about the level select area, the globe essentially. I had to play through the entire game in order to move as much of the globe as I can, because it does spin with the player as you traverse the map, and more of the globe reveals itself as you've traversed the map. Sadly, it's not an entire sphere as you would hoped it would be, but again, thanks to being able to remove HUD elements, there is an effect that's supposed to mask the edges of the globe that finally gets removed here, and now I can show you as much of the map as I possibly can, and please accept my apology if this map opens up to the player with DLC or something. I have not played this in years, but I do just want to show you as much of the globe as I possibly could. Taking the camera over onto the other side I can just show you a heck of a lot of ocean. Sadly, I was not able to get to the other side of this mystery continent by just traversing to the complete right-hand side of the map. And once again, just for the sake of people who have played these games before, I wanted to take the camera out and show you this map in its entirety and move the camera around a little bit inside as well, giving players a first-time chance to see some of these low-poly details up close. But now let's talk about the cutscene maps or also the battle scene maps, which are shared together. We'll give you a look at some of the more interesting ones up close, like the Arena Ferox, which sports sprite work of all things of various people in attendance. And it's really good quality. It's almost like PlayStation 1 sprite quality, but that's only the first few rows. If you were to take the camera up a little bit more, you could see even lower detailed sprites 
one where they're all shared together and moved in a less convincing way. There's no frames of animation, they're just tweening around, it's kind of funny. And this is what the Arena Ferox looks like all the way zoomed out. A lot of detail for an area that is heavily controlled by the camera. And oh yeah, and similarly, the map for Arena Ferox has models that are hanging outside in the bleachers as well, and they all seem to be various different warriors, as well as an axe wielder, and many, many more. These character models don't move at all, so they're just sort of like action figure poses. But what's really cool is that they have their own faces too. And I might be reaching a little bit here, but I do feel like that these could have just as easily been beta models for the units that are supposed to walk around on the map. They have a very similar level of detail as the character models that were used in Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, which is the only reason why I would even humor that theory. Anyways, let's zoom out the camera so I can show you how the outdoor scenes work. It's really, really cool when you take a look at it from this angle. So what's going on here is that every single area is just encased in a perfectly spherical sky dome. And then to save on resources, the actual ground that the characters step on is a lot, lot smaller than you might think. And then the developers used an effect to sort of make everything sort of fade out and just blend into the sky dome, which then tricks the player into thinking that the environments are way more vast than they actually are. There's also many areas in Fire Emblem Awakening that are just relegated to background scenery. I wanted to show you this shop area that uses a lot of reused assets, but still, we're now looking at these areas from angles that you have never ever seen before. Speaking of details that people have never seen before, a lot of people are asking about these relationship quarters and what it looks like when characters are going into the scene together. Well, the truth is that the environment sort of fades to black, which is something that the players would never be able to see, but the characters just sort of spawn in and out of the black void. And then this is really hilarious. There's a lot of instances where a character that's supposed to walk into frame for a certain scene will just be just outside the boundaries waiting to do that exact prompt. I wanted to show you that in this cutscene in particular because of the fact that Krom walks into the scene only being a couple of feet away clearly with an eye shot of Lucina and then says, you're not the only one who can eavesdrop. I heard every word. Gee, I wonder how that could have possibly been the case. And then some people want to see what it looked like when Pan transforms, seeing as it starts off inside of like a boulder and then smashes open into the beast. Well, it's sadly not super exciting, but of course I want to show you anyway that the character models essentially just swap inside that boulder. And similarly, when you transform into a new class, the screen usually fades to white and then fades back in to reveal the new class that you selected. Removing that white HUD will show you that once again the character just sort of snaps into a different character model almost instantaneously. Then here's the most disappointing part of this whole episode for me, the battle atop of Grima. I wanted to look at this so badly and it's literally the only battle map that has a weird thing going on where outside of the intended map the frames don't refresh outside of the boundaries. So it makes it really difficult to even see anything outside of the boundaries, as well as it's very hard on the eyes when you want to look at it. But I did the best I could here to kind of show you that Grima's wings are not fully modeled, as well as maybe this one will be a little bit harder to show off to you guys, but you can at least take my word for it that Grima's body is also not modeled on the bottom, and that it's essentially a very flat 3D model. And with all that said, I wanted to show you a zoom out of this particular area because it has a castle in the background and everything. It's really cool. And just say thank you so much for watching. Being a member would help me out tremendously, though also Patreon is a thing, and there's going to be a couple of uh, not safe for work discoveries that were made that I will put on the Patreon for any paid member. It's not content made for kids, so parents, please use your discretion, I guess. But thank you very much to everyone that's supporting the show. I will do a update video probably very soon just to kind of keep you guys up to date on how things are going. And with that said, I hope that you all enjoyed the new... I think and with all that said, I hope you enjoyed the first Fire Emblem Boundary Break episode. If there's enough support for this episode, you can expect more in the future. And if not, I hope you really enjoyed this one. It was nice to at least dip my toe. All right, guys. Again, thank you so much and take care.